at this point we have a little bit of time travel forwards rather than backwards because sadly despite much testing and plans the connection at Tardibig on the actual date August the 11th the 75th anniversary proved to be just a little bit too hiccupy to work so we're re-recording a week later things look a little bit different because then I was sat outside in, in the sunshine in the cracks and now I'm sitting inside with the rain hammering on the roof so uh, typical British weather I'm going to talk about the first letters between Robert Aikman and Tom Rolt, the first meeting between the two couples, Tom and Angela and Robert and Ray, and some of the events from that date in August 1945 through to February 1946, with the beginning of the IWA. This is the first letter from Robert Aikman to Tom Rolt sent via his publishers in July 1945. And on the right is the plaque which commemorates it. We're going to start with a little excerpt from the letter. To LTC Rolt, care of Messrs. Eyre and Spottiswood Publishers Limited, 14 to 16 Bedford Street, WC2, July 9th, 1945. Dear Mr. Rolt, my wife and I have just read your book, Narrowboat, with the very greatest measure of admiration and agreement. We are literary agents, but seldom encounter a new manuscript at once so distinctive and so penetrating. For many years, I have been interested in the canals and distressed both by the neglected condition of many of them and by a certain lack of enterprise with which many of the remainder are too commonly administered. I think, as you say, that it is a real danger of the canals merely being allowed to die, and for no good reason, as properly administered, they could still occupy a perfectly sound place in the national economy. He goes on to say a lot more, including that it has long occurred to me that some body might be founded to promote the welfare of the canals. So even at that very early stage, he was thinking, here's something that we could create a society for. And it was a catalyst which started something that I doubt either Rolt or Aikman or Angela or Ray had any idea of how big it would grow at the time. Now the plaque over on the right was placed there in 1981 by the Worcester and Birmingham Canal Society. Spot the deliberate mistake in this spot in 1946. Apparently it was Robert Aikman who supplied that date. Although by then he was uh, quite unwell, so uh, it's an understandable mistake. So um, later, if you if you'd been here, if you'd have been there, two well, LTC Rolt, care of Met moving swiftly on before it plays again. Um, if you had been there for the twenty fifth anniversary. Or 25 years ago for the 50th anniversary you'd have been taking part in a celebration in the church with readings and music from the period and waterway characters and vips galore and with of course refreshments to follow and in 2005 for the 60th they added an additional plaque which is in this picture on the front of it which um with sonia rolt there who's in the picture under the under the brolly also in the pouring rain which corrects the various dates and on the right, we have Ivor Kaplan and Michael and Becky smith Keary as the Rolts and Aikmans arriving from the station. And just a couple of weeks ago, if you'd been there, you would have met this wonderful team of volunteers who were tidying everything up and making it beautiful. But today you've just got me. And here's my boat at Tardibig. And I've added a picture taken by Bob Fox and BCNS to show that, um, that that was the scene last week. I seem to have a slightly worried expression, so it was probably one of the moments when we were wondering whether it was going to work or not. And here is Cressy, the Rolt's boat. Moored at Tardy Big since 1941, where some four and a half years later, Robert Aikman's letter arrived. They set off as a newly married couple from Banbury in July 1939. They only had about six weeks of traveling before war was declared. They started the war on the K&A with Tom working for Rolls-Royce at Hungerford, but he then moved to working for the Ministry of Supply, visiting engineering works all over the West Midlands, 
so moved the boat to Tardibig. And for the purposes of comparing with now, just note that largish house in the background. This is Tom Rolt's reply. Just a few days later, everyone replied very promptly to letters in those days. Narrowboat Crassy, New Wharf, Tardibig, Bromsgrove, Worcestershire, July 12th, 1945. Dear Mr. Eggman, thank you so much for your generous tribute to Narrowboat, which I can assure you I most deeply appreciate. I think that your suggestion that some body should be founded which could promote the welfare of the canals and interest in them is an admirable and exciting one. Six months ago, I would have doubted whether such a project would receive adequate response, but now, judging by the number of letters that I have received, I am inclined to think otherwise. Now he goes on to talk about how important to him the use part of the equation was. And that if half of that go, half the part that, if the use part of the partnership goes, half of the value is gone. And if preserved exclusively for pleasure, they'd inevitably tend to become precious. And this was something we discussed a little in the Q&A last week, which will be attached at the end of this. And after that, I remembered this particular bit of the letter, which I, I think is interesting in that he was very much for keeping the canals as a, a working, trade route. However, recognised, even when he wrote the book, that accepted it, recognised this when I wrote it, but accepted it as the lesser of two evils, the evil of neglect and abandonment being much the greater. I feel I would put up with swarms of the most ill-behaved holiday makers on a canal, if by such means it could be kept open, and at least it would be available for future generations who might put it to better use. So I hope we're all now putting it to better use. So this is the book that started it all, Narrow Boat, published in 1944. And if he hadn't written it, which he did in 1942, it then did the rounds of publishers who all thought it was far too niche, so it was languishing under the bed until he started a correspondence with a poet H.J. Massingham, who asked him why he hadn't written about the canals, to which he replied, I have, and produced the, the script which went on to be published. And of course none of that would have happened if he hadn't had the idea of a design for living, to live on a boat, to travel the canals, and to write for a living. If he hadn't met Angela Ored, who shared his enthusiasm for this alternative life, lifestyle, if he hadn't bought Cressy or Shropshire flyboats that had been converted by his uncle Carl Willans in 1929 for holidays. And if he hadn't spent months working on it to create a home at Tooley's Boatyard in Banbury. And if he hadn't married Angela in secret because her father objected so strongly to the match. And if they hadn't set off to travel. This is Tardy Big Now. We'll have a little look just to compare how it looked in, in their day to this day. That, this is from a little further down onto the lock and is the, the house you see in the background of the Cressy picture. Um, and this is the church on the other side. There's two pictures because the view they would have seen from Cressy is the one on the right. And that is now almost completely obscured by hedge. So what they would have seen, although from a different angle, is much more like the picture on the left. They would have seen quite a bit of the church. And they would have had a good view of the lock cottage, which probably didn't look quite as smart at the time, being at the end of the war when so little maintenance had been done. After the first two letters, there's a flurry of correspondence between them, arranging the dates. Some are handwritten, some are typed, there's a postcard. The reason all this is available is because Tar Robert Aikman kept every scrap of paper that came through his letterbox. So for that means we have lots of letters from Angela, but none from Ray, or very few. But he kept everything. And his, um, his letters were all carbon copied, often onto the back of something else. So that's another intriguing thing about looking through the archive is that you, you know which hotel he stayed at in July 1929, because on the back of it is a letter. And in its 
fascinating to dip into because at this time they didn't know what was coming. And the reason I was there at the National Archives in Kew looking at all this and reading it was because as part of Alarum Productions, Heather Wastey and I were working on a collection of oral histories, the stories of women who helped save the canals in the black country. But as part of the context, I wanted to get a sense of, of how the whole thing had come together. And I also wanted to know much more about the roles that women had played. I'm particularly interested in Angela Rolt and Ray Aikman. And I discovered they had done so much more than I'd, I'd first thought about. So out of it, this is my little moment to show you the book, the ID Canals book. Um, and there's lots more about that on our website. So the whole, the meeting set up for August the 11th, Something that isn't mentioned in any of the other accounts I found of it is that it wasn't just the Rolts and the Aikmans. It actually included friends of the Aikmans and Mr. and Mrs. Costa. Uh, and this letter here on the left says they're staying in Birmingham on the night of the 11th and they're very grateful to be seen that afternoon. And so it sounds the, the Costas were clearly there, although we don't ever hear about them again. Um, Howard Costa was a quite notable uh, photographer at the time. He was a self-styled portraitist of men. One of the ones I found is, is a picture of A.A. A. Milne with Christopher Robin. And there is another picture of Robert Aikman, which I think was probably taken by him. He was about to retire and Robert thought that he would rather like Tom's design for living idea. So he came on to see Cressy to see if that might be something he would, he would do. And we also have very detailed instructions on how to find Tardy Big Wharf from Tom Rolt. So on the day, there was uh, Robert Aikman, pictured here in his study. Um, the picture of Cressy in a lock in the centre, that is Robert and Ray Aikman. That was taken the following spring, once uh, Cressy was on the move again. Uh, and top right hand corner is Tom, at the helm of Cressy with Angela reading in the cabin down at the bottom left and a picture of Howard Costa. Poor Joan Costa, we don't have any pictures of. On, yes, on the day, they, uh, they all arrived about 2.30. They spent the, the afternoon and evening together. We don't know how what they talked about, but they clearly talked a lot and both couples got on incredibly well. They had a lot in common. Uh, aside from being interested in canals, they were also passionate about theatre, the arts and the supernatural. That was uh, something that Robert Aitman went on to write fiction in. I think Tom dallied in it and there's a correspondence between Angela and Robert about something called the Individualist Society. There's lots of interest there. They were all creative with uh, Robert said went on to write these super, supernatural stories. Ray was a children's author Tom wrote uh, non-fiction for his entire life. He wrote, uh, they went off to Ireland and he did a book for Irish canals. He wrote about all sorts of engineering. And as many of you know, he went on to be very significant in, in the Tally Slim Railway. Yeah, and Howard Costa, we, we didn't ever hear of again. There were also some things they had in common at, at a personal level in that, um, I thought all were only children, but in fact, Angela, I discovered, uh, with the help of, of another boat woman, Leslie Jordan, who helped us with some of the research, had a sister, Diana, who died when Angela was 17. Diana was 23, it was in 1932, uh, which I think must have had an impact, although there's no mention of it anywhere. Um, both Aikman and uh, Ray uh, yeah, both Robert and, and Ray Aikman had had quite difficult childhoods. Both Angela and Ray had the, this great loss, Angela of her sister. Ray's mother committed suicide in 1941 when she was only a young woman. So there were lots of connections at different levels, which they may or may not have talked about at any great length, but certainly I think helped to, to provide that glue that created this incredible friendship that lasted for well, sadly only five years. It's interesting to look at the, the different accounts of the day because I've only got the letters setting it up and the letters afterwards. Nobody wrote much about what happened on the day because they were there. 
In his autobiography, The Landscape Trilogy, uh, 1800 Days in Tardibig, Rolt makes absolutely no mention of the event at all. He doesn't, doesn't cover it. it. Possibly because it didn't seem important in the grand scheme of things, or possibly because after he and Aitman fell out in 1950 in in, with such acrimony, and of course his marriage to Angela broke down, it, perhaps it's hard to look back at what appears from the correspondence to have been a really happy and productive time. Robert Aikman in his uh, autobiography, The River Runs Uphill, does write about it. He says that when Rolt first mentioned Tardibig, he didn't quite believe this very strange named place could even exist. He had to look it up. He writes as though he went alone. Uh, I walked with my map from Bromsgrove. No mention of Ray or the Costas. He was very taken with Angela. He's, he writes about her lineage. She was a direct descendant of William IV through one of his children with his mistress, Mrs. Jordan, uh, and, and her hospitality. He's very complimentary about her hospitality. And this, this comes up one, again as they do various trips with them. Andrew even made their own bread on, Chris, on Cressy. A foretaste of lockdown, obviously. And then David Bolton in Race Against Time, his version describes a rather bucolic rural scene with Robert and Ray walking up the tardy flight in their London clothes to, to meet the Aikman, uh, to meet the Rolts. And no one mentions the Costas. However, they were there because there's a couple of letters a few days later where Tom writes to Ray saying, thank you both for arranging a very pleasant weekend. I did enjoy the expedition. So we're not quite clear what the expedition was and where they went, but it seems to have ended in a railway station because it says, I was rather sorry you did not wait to see the free fight. It really was an astonishing melee for a moment or two. When the dust settled and the friends who had come to assist our fellow travellers to secure seats had managed to extricate themselves, we were found to be only four aside and all with a full complement of limbs. So clearly there was some kind of uh, furore in a railway carriage. And this is a letter from Ray to Joan Costa, and I'm partly including it because there is so little of Ray in the letters. She typed many of them until the point at which the IWA had been established and the work was getting more and more and they took on Elizabeth Jane Howard to start doing some of the typing. Ray had done it all and even afterwards she did a lot of it and there were times when Robert was away on various sorts of trips when she, she ran the office but she seems to have been a very uh, reserved person who just liked to get on with things in the background. But in this letter, she writes to Joan saying, thank you for your letter of the 13th. And so sorry, they missed Costas versus the rest. So whatever this event was, it, uh, it was clearly quite entertaining. And she refers to them enjoying seeing Cressy. So there's a boat going past. Very nice sounding engine, but slightly distracting. When we do have letters from her, she does have a rather nice turn of phrase. The human race has more than a silly face. This is followed by a tremendous um, correspondence, letters hurtled for the, for the rest of 1945 and, and into 1946. Letters are hurtling between Cressy and Gower Street. And, and here is the origins of, of the two of them. Tom Rolt working on Cressy, in exactly the same spot that Angela we saw earlier was reading. He had a fold down desk as part of, part of his carpentry that he was very pleased with building. I have to say, I do think the stool he's sitting on looks incredibly uncomfortable. Every time I look at the photograph, I think, how on earth did you write several books sitting at that? And the other is Aikman's uh, study. And one of the interesting things about him is that he was extraordinarily clever and he would dictate directly to whoever was typing. There was no pause, no hesitation. The phone could ring, the doorbell could go, and he would just carry straight on afterwards as if nothing had happened. Which meant that whoever was typing for him had, had to keep up, so presumably he went at a reasonable pace. And of course it was all typed on, on um, manual machines, which was quite a, a skilled, much, much harder than working on a computer. 
the kind of things they were they cover in that period are their plans for the society uh, the name provisionally called the Inland Waterway Society so it's referred to as the IWS a lot they discuss similar groups like the Ramblers Association and the National Trust because Ray had some connections there the prospect of nationalisation from the canals, there was a canal joint committee at government level, which was not popular with either of them. They discussed who they might include. David Hadfield was a very early suggestion and other names that are familiar to us, um, like Eric uh, Lemare, who took many photographs and Robert Drafts, a manifesto. So some of that business work was going on. There's also lots of uh, more personal discussions about Tom's most recent book uh, about Worcestershire and Robert Aikman acting as his agent. Uh, another book he wrote called High Horse Riding. Robert's interest in buying a boat. There was quite a lot of exploring a boat. Although it came to nothing, partly because finding a mooring in London was going to be such a challenge. So that's something that hasn't changed much over the years. And quite a lot about theatre and the supernatural. The Rolts first visited the Aikmans in November and there's quite a lot of discussion about going to see Henry V and who was in it and getting tickets. And, uh, and they obviously shared lots of interests, lots of outings to the arts. Then there's getting ready for this first meeting in February 1946, which I, I thought would be a great, great planned event, but in fact, actually came to pass quite uh, quickly because in January, I think January the 28th, 1946, Tom writes, it really is time we got on with this meeting or we're going to, we're going to miss, the, miss the boat. Uh, so it was all set up really very quickly. Um, and it was very much a quick trawl around the main people that they wanted to have there. And actually that, just going to pause slightly there because I want to bring in with these these letters that were hurtling backwards and forwards in the discussion about looking at boats. This is one of the first letters from Angela, just to give you a, a glimpse of her handwriting and, and what she was talking about. And it was written after the Rolks had spent a couple of days with the Aikmans looking at a boat and some possibilities. Friday. My dear Ray. Safely tucked up in Cressy after one of the slowest journeys the GWR have ever perpetrated. Tom tells me the reason was our unprecedented number of coaches. We so enjoyed our two days. Tom is now at his lecture and I'm waiting up anxiously with kettle on the hob and hot water bottle in the bed, expecting a nervous wreck. Frightful excitement this morning. Four bananas. I ate one in the shop and nearly swooned with joy. More next week, but they are nearly all overripe, so I'm afraid that perhaps I shan't be able to send you any after all. I've got tins of grapefruit and cow and gate to console you somewhat. Tom back and all is well. Lecture went off fine, but audience of ghastly sticks. No proper arrangements made, about 50 people dotted over vast room, also, I think a chitty chatty talk had been anticipated and not canals past and present. Your letter arrived just as I was about to post this, so I'm adding a postscript. Your skirt adventures sound most interesting. If you ever come across a roll-on in this way, do buy it for me. Weighs 27 and pay up to £4. But I don't want you to search about in a frenzy. I think Angela's letters are delightful because whilst there is um, at times things about her photography, which was her particular creative in, in contribution, you know, one of the, the, all the concerns of life in post-war Britain with rationing and shortages and difficulty in travelling. And her letters are very much dashed off. They, they very rarely have a date. They are, there are several I think might be in the wrong place. It takes a lot of detective work to work out exactly where she's, she's been, um, where they fit into the, the chronology because all of this correspondence was only sorted and catalogued, I think in the 1970s. So moving on to the, the meeting, which was held at 11 Gower Street. And 
David Bolton refers to it as the inaugural meeting and says that Ray took some minutes in her beautifully rounded hand. But I haven't found any minutes and there are none in the IWA's archive. The first available ones are from May, at which point uh, Angela uh, Ray, sorry, Ray, is appointed to be an assistant secretary to take the minutes. And there's the apocryphal story that they thought they had, they had all arrived and the doorbell rang and it was one Captain Smith asking if this was the meeting of the Inland Waterways Association. Nobody admitted to having um, invited him, but he seems to have arrived and brought the name with him. So that was February the 16th, 1946. So back to at this spot, and it was in 1945, that journey began, which has brought us the canals we have for today. Thank you. It's obviously a fascinating story and you've done a lot of research uh, on, on this. Do you think there's much more to discover or have we been through all the records or are you, do you think there are records that are, are, are going to appear uh, yeah. that will, will, will start to throw some even more light on, on what we know already? I, yes, I think there is. And <clears throat> what we don't now have is that direct link of, of people. We don't have yeah. those that you know, we can go and, go and do oral histories with. But, you know, in the course of this work, I've discovered another orid that, that, that Angela had a sister. That that first visit is here is described in different ways, but in fact included the other couple, the Costas. And I think there's a lot of work to be done with the archives in that things like Angela not dating letters takes quite a bit of detective work to, to work out when she was talking about it. You can do it with the aid of old calendars and things and, and what she's talking about, but it, um, oh yes, I definitely want to go back and, and explore more. And I'm interested in moving on beyond the period that, that the roles were involved because mm. uh, there were a, there were a number of other women who became involved. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a question that's come through from, from Simon, Simon Judge. Uh, thank you for that question, Simon. Um, okay, do you think it mattered to the history of the association uh, and waterway restoration uh, that there uh, was such a big falling out? Oh, that's a really good question. That's the sort of question Simon would ask. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure. It's one, I, I found myself wondering what it would have been like if they had carried on. But of mm. course, the thing about a Robert Aikman was that he was incredibly driven and was quite hard to work with. Um, uh, is it Charles Had Hadfield dropped out very quickly? Um, yes, Charles Hadfield. Um, because he felt he couldn't work with Aikman. Mm. So, in some ways, I think that grit might have helped, but actually, I suspect there was an awful lot of an awful lot of misery that was unnecessary. Yes, it's a, it is an interesting uncertainty as I've immersed myself in the, the history of the association. There's, uh, I, I think, there's probably arguments both ways that uh, some of that uh, really uh, just built resolve within those that uh, saw that there was going to need to be additional action to really uh, keep the momentum and, and, and move things forward. And I guess within a few years, there were enough uh, other folks involved to, to uh, maintain some of that uh, momentum. Uh, and they were getting themselves organized in, in Gower Street uh, reasonably early uh, to, yeah. to bring a bit of organization uh, uh, around things. Um, and of course, they did always have this very different view, which I I haven't mentioned, I'm sure lots of people are aware of, which was that Aikman wanted to fight for all canals. He had, in a way, had a, a greater vision than Rolt in terms of what the canals might become. Mm. Rolt was very keen that they carried on being a working commercial, and if necessary, you would only keep the commercial ones. And so that they, they which could have been, I mean, that could have been the sort of creative tension yeah. and I think it was for a while 
but eventually it started to get a bit too tense. Well, this is one of the uh, real challenges, but also great opportunities. And we see this even uh, in, in IWA today and right across the waterways is that we need to the diversity of views and uh, motivations, uh, but that in itself then can bring some of those tensions. And so it's, uh, I think the real skill is, is keeping those different approaches, viewpoints, uh, motivations, uh, all uh, heading in the same direction. Um, because like, I, I think if, if, we'd, if we'd had two very similar people driving things forward at the beginning, uh, maybe we would have achieved half of what we've achieved. Uh, so it's it's always a real a real challenge, and I I see that myself uh, even in the uh, breadth and diversity of the wonderful people that we've got uh, in leadership and in volunteering roles right across the whole association. Um, so another question uh, here. It's good to see some folks on the call answering other people's uh, questions. So that's uh, that's great. Um, so do you think uh, they? foresaw how great an asset the canals would become for leisure and tourism uh, that we see today. Would they, what, what, what would they be saying if they could see us here today? I don't think they did. Well, I think Aikman might have been the closest to, to that vision. But I think, no, I think, I think his, it was very much about fighting to, to save the heritage. Hmm. And I'm... So no, leisure and tourism, I suppose just after the war, people began to, to think about holidays and doing things again. Mm. But I think at that stage, they probably didn't to any extent. I'm just thinking that it was, it took until the 60s before we started to see um, all those people who, who battled for the, um, you know, for the staffs in Worcester and the BCN and dug out the, the Dudley Tunnel and... Mm. Um, I mean, it's incredible stories that Heather Wasty and I have collected as part of I Dig Canals about you know, being towed into Dudley Tunnel in a, in a, in a little dinghy like a donut and uh, driving a dumper truck. And all those things came in the 60s. So I think that perhaps at this stage, when they were sitting here on that afternoon, 75 years ago, I think, I think they were just excited by the idea that, that something could be done. You know, yeah. they, agree. they didn't get as far as, as, although the plaque here talks about decided they'd create the Inland Waterway Association, they got as far as deciding that the canals needed a preservation society. Mm. And so things moved fairly quickly in terms of the association having its first meeting in February 46. Um, like that, that flurry of correspondence really did move things on reasonably quickly for those days. Like we, we were used to instant communication. But uh, that's a relatively short period of time to, to see things mm. moving on. So there seemed to be quite a bit of resolve there. Well, particularly the thing that I was saying about the, the actually organising the meeting. In fact, mm. all did, was done within three weeks. After Tom written on the 28th of January to say, we really we need to be getting on with this. And within a week or 10 days, they contacted the people they were interested in. They'd pulled, they'd got them together and they'd arranged a meeting at Gower Street. So there was a question a little bit earlier on about uh, the different motivations, uh, Aikman being a great self-publicist and uh, talking about I rather than we. Um, do you think there was any hint in any of the correspondence and so on that you've seen that the, the Rolts were concerned about this in those early years, uh, or did it suddenly become this great falling out relatively quickly in, you, in your view? Sorry, I just missed slightly that what the, the, I missed the, the key bit, which was yeah. what they are. Uh, Did you think there was any hint uh, that the Rolt, the, the Rolts were concerned uh, before the, the men fell out? Uh, that oh, yeah. It was too, too, the cracks too started to appear in 1947. Right. Um, and they appeared over various things. One was Jane Howard. Uh, whilst yeah. in uh, an oral history with her that we've got a recording of and her book, uh, she says that you know she and Jane were, were she and Ray were great friends, and that actually you know she, she took she took Robert off her hands for a bit. It helped, but the Rolts clearly didn't like that at all. There, there's um, uh, several letters. Uh, there's one in which Tom uh, expresses concern, 
and says, I mean, you know, this, is, this isn't really my business. And Ray comes back very briskly and says, no, it isn't. But there, so there were, those, there were those cracks there already. And certain tensions about Robert's expectation that everybody would also drop things. He had an income and mm. Tom rolled. They had this very small uh, allowance from Angela's estranged father, but Tom needed to, to work, to, he needed to write to earn a living. So Kate, as you look at the early history and, and the research that you've done, do you think there are any key lessons that we can learn from that today? Because the, the waterway uh, system and ecosystem is becoming even more complex. When we look at what the regeneration of the waterways meant back then, it was stopping the waterways falling into dereliction. It was starting to identify the changing use of the waterways. But of course, today, the challenges that face not just IWA, but the many navigation authorities, government, local authorities, uh, restoration trusts and so on, it's so complex. Are there any lessons you think we could, uh, we could learn? Mm. I'm not sure I dare to pronounce on that. It's, oh, uh, yeah, it is. It's, it's, <laughs> Well, it is very complex and so many more users you know at the mm -hmm. time they were looking at it, it was just about boats yeah uh and now there's there's such a, a a range of users i suppose it all comes down to talking and communication yeah i think i agree and i think, uh, mm. I think one thing i would like to see without getting too um endlessly um obsessed with with the past and the heritage but I do feel that it would be, I often see things from new, new boaters mm. and their expectations of what the canals can do is, is sometimes a bit ambitious. They, they seem to miss that you know, they're, they're in the middle of a living museum and that, you know, that managing and maintaining that is, is not an easy thing. Mm. And with weather like we're having at the moment where, you know, we are, um, uh, you know, one minute we're running out of water and the next we're flooded. Mm. So I, I think communication is what it probably all comes down to. Yeah, it's, it's certainly the, there are lessons there and uh, how we can work together uh, can, can really constructively, I think it, it, it's really key. Um, I'd also like to, I don't want to put anyone particularly on the spot, but uh, uh, I noticed that uh, that's Richard Parry from the Canal and River Trust is on our call tonight and uh, Richard thank you for joining us uh, and uh, Richard Hello from Tardy Big Richard <laughs> and uh, Richard if I may I'd, I'd just like to uh, thank you for your comments uh, when, uh, and I know that all panelists and attendees have seen this on the chat but just in case anyone hasn't noticed uh, Richard has said uh, many congratulations to IWA on reaching our 75th uh, birthday uh, from the, the Canal and River Trust. Uh, we wouldn't have the amazing network we enjoy today uh, without the effort of so many dedicated IWA members over the past 75 years. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, thank you. And I, I think uh, we recognize that IWA is, is there, has been there and will be there to work with the many uh, organizations uh, that are working uh, on this common cause that we all have. And I think that's, uh, if there's any lessons uh, from the past that I, I would like to bring to the fore, well then it's certainly that uh, let, let's try not to fall out. Let's recognize that there is uh, a lot that can be achieved by, by working together uh, and uh, continuing this, this great piece of work that we've, uh, we've achieved over the last 75 years. So I'm just looking at the uh, a few more questions that have come in as we uh, enter into the last couple of minutes uh, of this session tonight. Um, I'm just uh, looking at these things, which uh, we're probably not going to get to all of these. Um, well, I'll just say in the last 10, 15 seconds before you yes. do hit, hit cut, I'd just like to turn the camera around so that you oh, can. Oh yes, I think that's a very. So you can. Uh, I'll do it now. Here yeah, you go. let's do that. Go ahead. Why don't you do that? Right. So I have to and tell you whether it's, it's tuned in or not. There we go. Yes, we can. We can. We see can that. away from the local. <laughs> when they're not trying to fall over. Great piece of photography. Excellent. Well, it's good to good to be able to there see it that. Is. 
proof that we are mm. actually live on uh, site at our live from Tardybig. At, at Tardybig. So look, I'm very live. We we uh, won't be able to handle all the questions. We'll uh, capture all those questions and some fantastic suggestions. Uh, but uh, Kate, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Uh, please keep an eye out for future waterway webinars. Uh, we will be continuing with this series. Uh, and I'm sure there'll be many more to come over the coming months. So thank you and good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>